Welcome once again to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. Tonight's topic is entitled, 3,000 Years to Accomplish a Cover-Up. We're going to take a look at some things that have been covered up and literally slid under the door and handed to Christianity. In fact, tonight's subject will make Watergate look like child's play. You'll have to reach down, take hold of your chair, and hang on because there may be some real surprises in tonight's presentation that may be rather shocking. We hope you'll keep your heart and soul open as we study from God's holy word and as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. Let's join Pastor Kenneth Cox now with his astonishing presentation, 3,000 Years to Accomplish a Cover-Up. Very happy to welcome each of you again this evening. As the United States was being settled and people were moving west, Many times the settlers that were moving into the country run into confrontations with the Indians, not understanding each other, not speaking each other's language, uh, the settlers coming in and killing the game, and many of the problems of communication. Uh, sometimes there was conflicts that arose, and many times these Indians would come in and would raid a settlement, and sometimes they would take some of the men captive. They would take them back to their village, and there they would take that man and they would stand him at the end of two long lines of warriors. The warriors would be armed with knives and tomahawks, and they would tell this man that if he could run, right down between those two rows of warriors and get to the other end alive, he would be free to go home. Now, if he didn't want to run, then they took his life in a very slow, cruel way. A lot of men tried to run it. A few who were able to run like the wind and dodge like a rabbit, got to the end alive and went back home to tell about it. This became known in American history as running the gauntlet. What I'm telling you tonight is that every one of you here, I don't care who you are, you're running the gauntlet. Oh, I understand, we're not, we don't wrestle or fight against warriors, Indian warriors, but the scripture does say that we're very much in a battle. It says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, that we are. We're running a gauntlet of temptation, and the truth of it is that if you are running it in your own strength and your own power, you won't make it. There's no way you're going to make it. In fact, as Jesus talked to Simon Peter, he said this to Simon Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Said Simon Peter, the Lord wants you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail and when you have turned again, strengthen your brother. And he said, Simon, I'm praying for you that your what? Your faith won't fail. Now, the only way that you and I are going to be able to run that gauntlet of temptation and get to the end alive is simply by putting on the armor of God. It's the only way you're going to make it. For it says very clearly, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You can't make it in your own strength. And I find there are a lot of Christian people that are trying, and I mean desperately trying, to go through and make it to the end, but they're trying in their own strength. By the word of truth, 
by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. You must have on the armor of God. And I'm very much concerned about Christians today for I find them talking about putting on the armor of God, but I don't find very many of them reporting for duty. Why do you put on armor? You put on armor for warfare. And you need to put on the armor of God and you need to report for duty. It's what you need to do. But you've got to have on the armor of God. Like it said, by the word of God, you and I have to have our faith in what God says. We have to trust what he says only as we're willing to go to the scripture. We're willing to find out what the Lord has to say. That little poem that I've mentioned to you several nights now that says, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? That's the question. That's what you and I must make absolutely sure. Now, tonight, we're going to move way back in time. We're going to start clear way, way back, and we're going to trace step by step the movement and how things have happened and taken place. Let's go clear back. We read a text about this the other night but we're going to put it together a little more. Ezekiel 28, verse 14, speaking of an angel by the name of Lucifer, and it says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. God created this being, Lucifer, he stood next to the throne of God. He was in charge of all the angelic hosts. God made him absolutely perfect, but it says iniquity was found in him. What was that iniquity? Well, in the New Testament, it talks about this iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, and it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called what? God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. This angel that God had made, that God had created with his own hands, that angel wanted to be God. And as the result, war broke out in heaven. This being, this angel, became known as Lucifer, the devil, and Satan. And in the book of Revelation, it describes it. It says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So when the devil was cast out to this earth, he still hadn't changed. He still wanted to be God. Now I'm going to back up right to the book of Genesis and we're going to begin to see the development of something, how it took place. In Genesis, the 10th chapter, Verse 8, it says, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. Now, it talks about this man, Cush, having a son by the name of Nimrod. The scripture gives you a rather interesting background on this man because the next verse says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, actually, in the Hebrew, that text also has in it, which we don't get in the English, but in the Hebrew, it gives you the idea that this man, Nimrod, was rebellious, that he actually was against God. He was a mighty hunter. That's very important but he also was not with the Lord. He went contrary to God. 
he was rebellious to the Lord, and the scripture goes on and says this about him. Genesis 10, verse 10, and it says, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now, if you have a Bible that has a center margin in it, you know what I'm talking about? Right in the middle of it, you'll find margin there. If you will look this text up in Genesis 10 and verse 10, you will find a little number by it if your Bible has a center margin. And if you look that number up in the center margin, you'll find it'll say Babylon. In other words, it's saying that the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon. Nimrod is the one that established the city of Babylon. Now, there's two things very important about Nimrod. One, you see, as sin entered, the animals became vicious. And to the people in those days, the animals were vicious. It was a problem. And anybody who was a mighty hunter was revered by the people. They considered him a special person because of his ability to protect them. Secondly, Nimrod was the one who started the idea of building walls around the city to protect the people. And the people looked upon him as a great person. In fact, they took it a step farther and they began to deify him. They began to look upon him as a god, more than human. This is not uncommon with man. If you go back in history, mankind has deified a lot of human beings. They deified the Caesars. They deified the Pharaohs. They deified Alexander the Great. They looked upon them as more than human, and that's what they did with Nimrod. They began to deify him and considered him more than human. Now, his wife, his wife's name was Semiramis. When Nimrod died, his wife took his body, threw it in the river, and told the people that he had gone to the sun and was now the god of the sun. And the people begin to worship Nimrod as the god of the sun. The city of Babylon began to turn itself over to the worship of the sun. They considered the sun as the greatest of gods. For instance, if you go over there, that part of the world today, you can still see. Like if you go over to the Parthenon, you can still see the worship of the sun god. You see this chariot coming up out of the ocean with four horses and this man driving it. This is the sun god. He was the god of conquest, the god of victory. He always went forward. He never went backwards. He was the greatest of all their gods. And the people worshipped him and particularly the city of Babylon turned itself over to the worship of the sun, the sun god. Now, you see, we come to the time, if you remember, of the flood. The whole world is destroyed by water, as the scripture talks about it. And after it had been destroyed by water and man began to populate the earth again, they were afraid that it was going to flood again. So we read here, Genesis 11, 14, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a what? A tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They said, We're going to build this tower, and if there's ever a flood again, we'll be able to get up in the tower above the water, and we all won't be destroyed. And you remember that it says that God confused the languages and they began to speak other languages. When they began to speak other languages, they kept the same gods that they worshipped. For instance, Nimrod 
became known as Baal or Zor or many other names that they had for the sun god. Same god, just different names. Now his wife, Semiramis, after her husband's death, she became pregnant. She told the people that she had conceived from her spirit husband in the sun. And the people begin to deify her. They begin to worship her as a goddess of love. And when the net languages were confused, they begin to call her different names. They called her Semiramis. Some called her Venus, the goddess of what? Love. Others referred to her as Diana. Haven't you read in the book of Acts where Paul was over in Ephesus and the people were saying, great is our goddess Diana. Same one. Ashtaroth, Ashtire, these are all names for the same one. She gave birth to a boy. The people believed that the boy was the result of her spirit husband and the son and her, and so they deified him also. And the boy's name they called Tammuz was the boy. Now, I don't have time tonight, folks, to tell you what the devil has done here, but you ought to be thinking because you can see a perfect counterfeit for the birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, it was set up perfectly, and if you want to read more about this, because I just wanted to give you some background, because you're going to see now its influence on, on the people clear up to our day, but if you want to read some more about it, go down to the Baptist bookstore and buy a book called The Two Babylons by Hislop. It'll give you a whole background. Go to the library and check out the Egyptian books of the dead. It'll give you a whole background all about this that took place. They're very well documented. Gives you some ideas on ancient history. But let's see the influence now of this upon God's people. You remember, the Bible talked about a man by the name of Abraham. And you remember he had a son by the name of Isaac. And Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob. And Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. One of those sons' names was Joseph. And you remember the brothers didn't like him too well. And uh, they sold him to a caravan of Ishmaelites on the way down to Egypt. You remember that? And so he's carted off to Egypt. And after a few years, Jacob sends his sons down to Egypt to buy grain. You know who they had to buy it from? Joseph. He's now the prime minister of the country. Okay? And after negotiations and all, Finally, Joseph sends his brothers back to Canaan to get their aged father and to bring him to Egypt. Jacob, his sons, their wives, about 80 of them, come to Egypt. Joseph goes out there and meets his father. And you remember the Pharaoh, out of respect to Joseph, gave to them the land of Goshen. You remember that? Okay, and you remember they moved in, and then it says that as years passed, there came a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, and the children of Israel went into bondage. You remember that? Slavery. And that went on for 400 years. And let me tell you, when you go over to Egypt and you see those pyramids and all those things, a lot of that was built by Hebrew slave labor. And then God called a man by the name of Moses. And he said, Moses, you go down there and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Ten plagues took place. And you remember the last plague is when the destroying angel passed over and all the firstborn dead died. And then you find that Pharaoh let him go and the children of Israel get out to the Red Sea. The Red Sea opens, and you remember they cross, and when Pharaoh tries to follow him, then the sea closed back up and drowned the Pharaoh and his army. Okay. Now, these people are out in the Sinai Desert. They come to Mount Sinai. God says, Moses, come up here into the mountain, and so Moses goes up into 
the mountain, and he spends 40 days there with the Lord. You remember that? Okay. Down in the camp, after about 10 days had passed, the men of Israel go see Moses' brother, Aaron, and they say, where's Moses gone? Aaron said, well, he's gone up in the mountain to commune with God. And they say, okay. A few more days pass, and they go to Aaron, and they say, uh, Moses not coming back, is he? And Aaron said, oh, yeah, he's coming back. And they said, you sure? He said, yes, he'll be back. About three weeks pass. And they go to Aaron, and they say, no, Moses isn't coming back. He's left us out here in this wilderness. Aaron said, no, he's coming back. Another week passes, and they say, Aaron, we don't think he's coming back. And Aaron assures them again, and another week passes. And finally, they go to Aaron, and they say, listen, Moses is not coming back. We want you to take this gold that we have and you, we want you to make us a god, a golden calf, and we'll worship it, and we'll say, this is the god that brought us out of Egypt. Listen what begins to happen. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have what? Corrupted themselves. He said, these people that you brought out of the land of Egypt They've corrupted themselves. They're down there worshiping golden calf. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molten calf and worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Here they are worshiping this golden calf. Let me ask you something. Where did they get the idea of a golden calf? Do you think they just conjured that up in their head? No, they got that from the Egyptians. They had watched the Egyptians worship that calf many, many times. You see, that bull calf was a god of fertility to the Egyptian. That's what it was about. They had seen that, and they said, make us one of these golden calves. This will be our god. Now listen to what happened. As soon as it, soon it was, or excuse me, so it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, so Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the table out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Now, here he gets down there close to the camp, and he sees all these people, and he's carrying in his hands the Ten Commandments that God has written with his own finger on tables of stone, and he takes them and throws them down and breaks them to pieces. Why? Didn't he know they were worshiping a golden calf? Didn't he know that? Huh? Sure, God had told him they were. So why, when he gets down to the camp, camp would he break those commandments? I'll tell you why. Listen. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Now what they were really doing, you see that bull calf was a god of fertility, and they're out dancing around that golden calf without any clothes on. There's real, real problems here. And what you're seeing is not a very pretty picture, and Moses doesn't relate to it in a very nice way because this is what happens. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Now he said, Everybody that's on the Lord's side, come over here. And people came from every tribe, but only of the tribe of Israel did every man, woman, and child come. That's why they became the priest. It's because every man, woman, and child of the tribe of Levi came over on the Lord's side. So God said, I'll make them the priest. Okay. And he said to them, to the children of Levi, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in, 
and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Well, that's strong. He said, now, if these people want to worship that golden calf, kill them. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. 3,000 of them stayed out there with that golden calf and 3,000 of them lost their lives. You see, the devil, they just gotten out there. They just gotten in the wilderness and the devil said, I'm going to throw a wrench right here in the whole works right now. And God said, no, you aren't. And 3,000 of them lost their life. You would have thought that the children of Israel would have said, well, <laughs> we better straighten up and fly right. You know, we ought to do it right. But they didn't. Listen. Then Israel remained in a Kai grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. Now, I've got to explain just a little bit here, folks. You've got to understand that the worship of these pagan gods all kinds of immorality went on with it. I mean, like you can't even imagine. So this is why you're finding Israel all the time running off from the Lord. And this is why they're involved with these women, these Moabite women, because it was part of the worship of their gods. They invited the people to sacrifice to their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the angry Lord was roused against Israel. Now here the children of Israel have forsaken the Lord, and they've gone over to Baal. You know who Baal is? Baal is the sun god. And so they've turned to worshiping the sun, and here they are worshiping the sun, and this is what God told Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun. He said, if they want to worship the sun, hang them out there in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned from Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Now, I, I'm hoping you're getting a picture when I talk about a conflict, there is a conflict, and you need to understand there is a real one going on. I mean a real conflict, and they lost their lives. Over and over, you will find incidents one after another like this. For instance, you remember there was a king of Israel by the name of Ahab? Listen to what it says about him. Now, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. When it says more than all that were before him, that covers a lot of ground, friends. And it came to pass as though it had been a tribal thing for him to walk in the son's sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zedouans, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, you look at that text carefully when it says that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Did you notice how their, her father's name ends? He was named after the god Baal. He was not only the king of the Zedouans, he was the high priest of the temple of Baal, and he even named his daughter after the god Baal. And when Jezebel got through with Ahab, he forsook the Lord. Then Ahab, when it says he there, set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Terrible what he did. And you remember the Lord sent a prophet by the name of Elijah, and Elijah walked into his court and said, you need to change. He told Ahab and Jezebel both, you need to repent. And they said, get this old man out of here. And he left. And it didn't rain one drop in Israel for three and a half years. At the end of three and a half years, he came back. He told Ahab, he said, if the Lord's God, then worship him. 
If Baal's God, worship him. And he told him to gather all the children of Israel up on the top of Mount Carmel. And they went up there, and he had the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove, there were 850 of them, to build an altar and to put a sacrifice on it and to pray and see if Baal would send down fire out of heaven and burn up the sacrifice. And you remember they prayed all morning long, clear to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and nothing happened. And then Elijah rebuilt the altar of God and he walked over there to the side of the mountain and knelt and prayed and he said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, if thou be the God of Israel, send fire from heaven and burn up this sacrifice. And the scripture says that that fire fell and it burned up the sacrifice, it burned up the wood, it burned up the stone, and it licked up the water that was in the ditch. And all the people of Israel said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. All right, follow me carefully. At this point, I better say something. There's going to be, I'm going to get close home now. Is that okay? Huh? You all right if I get close home? You're going to be like the lady, you know, the preacher was preaching. She was saying, amen, 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 and just amen and everything he said. And then all of a sudden, boy, he hit something that just cut her right to the heart. And she said, ooh-wee, he's quit preaching and started meddling. Is that the way you're going to be? because I'm going to get close home. Now listen carefully, because we're talking about a cover-up. That's what we're talking about. 3,000 years to accomplish a cover-up. We're talking about things that were covered up and slid under the door and handed to Christian people as Christian that didn't have its origin in Christianity. Book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verse 16, it says, Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Now the Lord's telling Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, don't pray for these people because I'm not going to hear you. What are they doing that's so bad? Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, that doesn't sound too bad. And the women, or the fathers kindle the fire, that doesn't sound too bad either, does it? And the women knead their dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? What were they doing? Oh, they were just making some little cakes. And they were putting the letter T in them for the god Tammuz. And they were offering it as a sacrifice to Tammuz. You ever heard of hot cross buns? They don't come from Scripture. They were strictly a pagan custom that was just taken and slid under the door and handed to people. Not Christian in its background. You want to go on? I just started. Huh? All right. We'll go to the book of Ezekiel. Let's see what it says. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now towards the north. So I lifted my eyes towards the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Now, what that text is saying is the prophet looked at the sanctuary, and right there in the entrance of the sanctuary, they had put up a pagan god, a pagan image. God said it made him jealous. Now, listen carefully. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing, the great abominations the house of Israel commit here? to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Here's a hole in the wall of the court. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. Here's a secret entrance into God's sanctuary. Then he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel 
portrayed all around on the walls. Got inside the sanctuary and there on the walls, they had all these different animals hanging there on the walls that were gods of fertility to the pagans. God's house. And he said to me, turn again and you'll see greater abominations that they're doing. Worse than this. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, the women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz, the son of Nimrod and Semiramis. Here they are weeping for Tammuz. Let me tell you a little bit about Tammuz. You see, they believed that Tammuz was a god of reproduction. That's the way they looked upon him. And so they believed that Tammuz, as the grass began to turn brown in the fall and the leaves began to fall off the trees and all of nature began to go dormant, they believed that meant that Tammuz was dying. They believed that Tammuz died every fall. They believed in the spring when the grass began to green up and all the birds began to sing and the trees leaved out and it was blooming and reproduction is plentiful throughout all of nature. They believed that Tammuz was coming back to life. So they had 40 days of weeping. 40 days before the sun reaches the vernal equinox. They wept for Tammuz to come back to life. You ever heard of 40 days of Lent? That's where it comes from. It doesn't come out of this book. It's totally a pagan custom that was just slid under the door, handed to people as a Christian custom. You want to continue? You see, they believe. They believed that Semiramis conceived Tammuz about the last of March, 1st of April. And they all believed that Tammuz was born on December the 25th. That's where you get Christmas. Christ was not born on December the 25th, folks. You see, we don't have any trouble knowing about the time of Christ's birth because the Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus was six months younger than John the Baptist, and the Bible tells you very clearly when Elizabeth conceived, and so we can know when John the Baptist was born, and we find that Jesus was born the latter part of September, 1st of October, not on December the 25th. But this is something that we do, you see. It's a custom. I'm talking about a custom that's been handed to people, and we just accept it with our eyes closed. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it's wrong to give one another gifts. I don't see anything wrong. I don't see anything wrong in remembering a day in honor of the birthday of Christ. What I do see wrong is ignorance. That's what I see as being wrong that when we don't know what we're doing, I do have a little trouble when people give gifts to everybody and they remember the birthday of Christ and never give him one. I have trouble with that. But you see, that's where it came from. It also happens to be where we get Easter from. It comes from the god Estar. If you don't believe it, then answer a question for me because ever since I was a boy about that tall, I've always wanted to know what Easter eggs and bunny rabbits had to do with the birth of Christ, or the resurrection of Christ. You see, the Easter eggs and bunny rabbits are symbols of fertility for the pagans. That's where they came from. Now, don't misunderstand me again. I'm not saying that it's wrong to remember a day in honor of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to get across to you that you need to open your eyes and you need to see what's going on. That's what I'm trying to get across. Now listen carefully because it continues here in Ezekiel. Then he said to me, have you, have you seen this, O son of man? 
Turn again and you will see greater abominations than these. Worse than this. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, about twenty-five men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshiped the what? The sun towards the east. Here they are in God's temple, and they're not worshiping the Lord, they're worshiping the sun. Worse than that. You see, over and over you find God trying to get the children of Israel not to worship these pagan gods, not to worship the sun. There was a king in Israel by the name of Hezekiah. It says, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now, he went to Hezekiah and he said, you're not going to live. You need to get everything in order. You're going to die. Hezekiah didn't want to die. He turned his face over to the wall and cried like a baby and pled with the Lord not to die. Now, God wasn't trying to hurt this man. God was trying to protect him. God could see things that were coming and this man had served the Lord, and the Lord knew it would be much better for him to be laid to rest. And let me tell you a little secret. You can write this in your black book also. Don't go around putting question marks where God puts periods. It'd be a whole lot better. But he's turned his face over there and said, Lord, I don't, don't want to die. And so God told Isaiah, said, go tell him I'll give him 15 more years. Fifteen years he wished he hadn't seen. So Isaiah gets over there, and he says, the Lord's going to give you 15 more years. And Hezekiah said, how do I know for sure? And so Isaiah said, well, said, you want the sundial out in the courtyard? Do you want the shadow to go forwards, or do you want the shadow on the sundial to go backwards? And Hezekiah said, Hezekiah answered, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. That meant forward 10 degrees. No, let the shadow go backwards 10 degrees. And boy, the old sun stopped dead still and moved backwards 10 degrees. Do you understand the implications of that? Down in the city of Babylon, they worship the sun. <laughs> it's the great conquering hero. It always goes forward. It never goes backwards. It's the god of conquest, and it stopped dead still and moved backwards. Boy, that shook them up so bad that they sent an envoy to see Hezekiah. Listen. However, regarding the ambassadors for the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, they sent a delegation down there and they said, hey, who is this God that you worship that's so great that he can stop our God and move him backwards? Finally, with the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel learned their lesson, and you don't find them worshiping pagan gods after that. But we come to Christ, and Jesus comes, and they reject him. They don't accept him. They turn their back on him. And the gospel went to the Gentiles, but the Gentiles are pagans. They worship the sun. They worship the gods of fertility. And so by the time we reach 300 A.D., almost half of the Roman Empire has become Christian. There's an emperor by the name of Constantine. He sees that it would be politically to his advantage to espouse the cause of Christianity. So he tells everybody that he had a dream, and in the dream he saw a cross, 
and that he was going to become a Christian. He even took his army, marched them through the river, and told them they had all been baptized and were now Christians. But he wanted to do anything he could do to make Christianity appealing to the pagans. And so in 321 A.D., Constantine signed the Edict of Constantine which said from that day on, Christians would not worship on the Sabbath. They would worship on Sunday, the day of the Son God. And you find a change took place. He enforced it and told them that they were to worship on Sunday from that day on. That's how the change took place. I'm talking about a cover-up. And we find that our forefathers have kept it and it's been handed to us as a Christian custom when it doesn't have its background in Christianity. It has its background in paganism. And you're saying, but Brother Cox, I've done this for years. I, I, I've kept Sunday for years. What am I supposed to do? Well, the best advice I can give you is the words of Peter. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. That's simply what I can say, is that he just wants you and I to follow him. You see, if I understand the book right, if I understand what the book is saying, the book is saying that you and I are to walk with him by faith. That means sometimes when it's hard, that means sometimes when we don't know how it's going to work out, that you and I are to walk with the Lord by faith. That's what he's asking us to do, to simply place our faith in him and walk with him day by day, and he promises that if you and I will walk with him by faith, he will bless us as we walk with him. I want you to listen tonight as Steve sings about walking with the Lord in faith. Tomorrow night, our subject is $5,000 reward for a missing text. This is a text in Scripture that people believe is there. There are people that would really almost stake their lives on it. And that's what we're going to look at because it affects us very much because people believe that's there. And we need to understand whether it's in Scripture. It has an effect on our lives. So we hope that all of you will be here as we talk about $5,000 reward for a missing text. As Kurt mentioned, you know, we we find ourselves sometimes believing that there are some things in the Scripture that's not there. And we need to make sure that we're building our faith on what the Scripture says. So we hope that you each can be here as we study God's Word together. Okay, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word, for the opportunity that has given us to study it together. May our faith in you be strong. May we realize that we must seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and you'll take care of everything else. Bless each one here. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good night. God bless each of you.